Hi, good morning, everyone. Okay, so my name is Govind. I'm from AstraZeneca, uh, based out of Chennai. We traveled from Chennai to Bangalore yesterday. And uh, I'm representing the global business services from AstraZeneca. Uh, we are a leading bio uh, pharma company spanning across uh, more than 100 countries. And we, we are into different uh, therapeutic areas like oncology, immunology, cardiovascular, renal metabolism, etc. So this is some of the key areas that we focus as a company, as an organization. So today uh, we are here to talk about, not to talk about the drug discovery or the other phases that happens in a pharma, right? So we are more uh, going to be talking more about, uh, yeah, so we are going to talk more about what is, uh, how AI is used or how data science is used within a pharma company, right? And I think most of you may be aware, some of you may be aware, some, some of you may not be aware. So we thought this is a very good opportunity for us to present in front of you what all we do, right? So uh, first, before I start, I have a question. Uh, how many of you know the life cycle of a drug? Okay, so I don't want you guys to answer. So I just want others to answer this question. So I want to know, uh, can anybody guess how much time it takes from, a, uh, from making a molecule to a medicine? Approximately, how much time it takes? Sorry? 15 to 20 years, okay. Any other guesses? 30 years? All right. Any other, any other guesses? Five to? Five to 10, okay. Any other guess? 20? All right. So, uh, so yeah, so we have got a lot of uh, close answers. So the nearest one would be 15 to 20 years, right? And I just want to quickly take you through the life cycle of a medicine life cycle, I would say. So if you look at the first uh, image here, you can see the initial phase is research and development, right? Which is more of finding the potential medicine, the molecule, and then from there we start the clinical studies, goes, uh, it starts off with the uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, et cetera, right? And when we reach towards the phase three studies and reg uh, regulatory submission and pricing, we also start the pre-launch activities. So in terms of access, access to the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the uh, patients, right? So how do we access the uh, unmet needs of patients, which all geographies needs to, uh, needs to be focused and those kind of things, which is uh, part of the pre-launch activity. Then we move on to the launch, launching the new medicine after the regulatory submission and uh, we launch the medicine, post-launch post research and development happens next, post-exclusivity and all, all together it's taking close to 20 years, right? So this is how it works. And we would have seen some exceptions, uh, some outliers when COVID uh, outbreak happened, right? So there, there was a lot of uh, uh, speed at which the drug discovery and uh, the way things, the things came out, right? It was in a very rapid phase. So I think there's a lot of AI and other technologies that was involved uh, to enable that, right? So, uh, so we just want to emphasize that uh, there's a lot of other things that happens in a pharma company, right? It's not just that, uh, I mean, obviously scientists are the most important people in this fraternity, but also there are a lot of enabling services, and we are one of one such enabling services, right? So if you look at AstraZeneca India presence, we are more than 3,000 today, and uh, uh, we started our GITC, which is Global Innovation Technology Center, in Chennai uh, in the year 2014. And uh, now we have ramped up, and we, we are having an uh, employee base of around 3,000 only in Chennai. We have a GBS presence as well in Chennai and Bangalore, and we also have a R&D facility in uh, R&D team in uh, Bangalore, so which is around roughly around 400 people. So that's about uh, where we are, how we how we operate, and what do we do? All right. Now I'll so I'll, I'll in, uh, request my colleagues to talk more on what we do in terms of data science and AI in healthcare. And post that, we'll also have some sort of interactions with you. We just want to hear your questions, right? We really want to understand what are your uh, queries about, or maybe what are your expectations about a pharma company, or, or how do you see yourself? If you want to be a, a part of a pharma domain, what, what are your expectations, and uh, how we'll try our best to answer those questions. So thank you, everyone, and I'll hand it over to Dinesh now. Thank you. Thank you, Govind. Clear, audible? Right. So, whenever I meet someone new, 
or someone from my past, the first question that I receive is like, and I say like, I work in a pharma industry, the first question is like, oh, you manufacture medicines. Immediately followed by the next question, but you studied computers, right? But what are you doing in a pharma? The next six minutes, I'm going to briefly elaborate what I briefed them. Good morning, fellow ciphers. I'm Dinesh Ramu from AstraZeneca. To make this session more interesting, at least that is what I believe, let us do a mass role play. Let's put us all in the shoes of a pharma CEO. So let me tuck my tummy a little in. Our CEO is a bit fit. As a pharma CEO, what do you do first? Any, any options? OK. OK. Hmm? Great. So as a pharma CEO, obviously the first thing that a new, new CEO has to do is discover new drugs. As Govind explained, a drug discovery process is a complicated one taking multiple months. There are like several professionals involved in a drug discovery. The, what we do is like we help the company to identify the right professionals, scientists, researchers, biologists, chemists, etc through going through, streaming through several publications and articles. Earlier, we were using the NLP tools available in our arsenal. And now we are trying our hands on the large language models. And these publications and articles are with respect to the particular indication or therapeutic area. In a parallel world, what we do? We identify the patient population who are suffering from that particular indication. We analyze on the burden of disease on the patients. What are the existing treatment options that are available? What gaps do they have? Once you have your professionals and your patient population, and after multiple years of hard work, voila, on one final day, your drug is approved. Fine. Once your drug is approved, what do we do next? We require to find the right doctors who can take our medicines to the patients who are in need. To identify the right doctors, we make use of all the external internal data sets that we have. We perform several analytics over the doctor's profiles. We do segmentation, targeting, alignment, the behavioral analysis on the prescription pattern of the doctors, and how aligned are they with AstraZeneca and with the competitors. Once you have identified the right doctors, the next step is to engage them through various channels. Like you engage them through email marketing, sample allocation, rep visits, and many more. And all these independent variables result in one dependent variable, which is your sales analytics. We perform several analytics over the sales data. Once a drug has started generating the sales, we double click on the sales data on different parameters. Demographic wise, insurance or payer level analytics, competitor analytics, etc. And this cycle goes on and on and on until a drug loses its patent. And what do we do when a drug loses its patent? Do we stop? Definitely not. And I take a cue from Doni. And what do we do? There are several other brands waiting for us to analyze their data in parallel. As a pharma data scientist, we put volume and sensitivity as our two eyes, because we are dealing with the data of the most complicated product in the world. It's us, the people. With this, let us all come out of the shoes of the pharma CEO. And I can loosen my tummy a little bit and hand it over to Gopinath for some exciting things in the world of generative AI. Thank you all. Thank you, Dinesh. Hope I'm audible. OK. So now you all understood what is the past or the, how the analytics has been working for healthcare for past many decades. Now let's try to move a little forward and see how the present looks. So there comes the mandatory generative AI sessions now. OK. So now people who are here, come, let's understand and imagine what could be one of the key challenge 
are a problem for any global organization, especially if an organization that is serving patients for across more than 100 countries in six continents. So the problem would be like every day people and systems are generating huge amounts of data and also at the same time consuming data. So this creates a big data problem. So any business users who wants to get into this data, traverse to that, both in unstructured and structured format, and find some quick insights, it's not almost easy. You need to have a special team, analysts, who jump into the data, find the insights for you. It might take its own time. But how can we leverage generative AI and look for some solution in that? So that's where we are trying to do some quick prototyping, and let's see how this helps the business user. So for that, first we'll start with a knowledge processing layer. So here the basics is very simple. First, let's try to collect all the data that is available in the organization. It could be in any data source, or it could be from any data type as well. It could be in PDFs, it can be in PPTs, it could be in document types, or even audio and video files as well. So once we have all these data files with us, now let's put it into the parser block. This is a simple Python library, or inbuilt with several other small libraries in that. So it can easily handle different data types, and then convert this information into proper textual format. So once we have the textual information in place, let's summon the LLMs, which also helps to do the summarization of this. So LLM has two parts here. First, we'll look at the part that is helping us in the summarization. Why would we need LLM to do a summarization? We can do it in a regular NLP way, like cleaning the text, doing stop word removal, all those things. But what happens is the quality of the embeddings that is generated from the textual information reduces. So now we have the LLMs that can help us to create summaries of the information that we have. The quality of embeddings, that is the next step, is going to be slightly higher. So how do we do these embeddings? For now, we can look into specific domain-based models, because it is because of uh, pharma-based. Sometimes it could be legal-based, or it could be e-commerce. But the model that you are going to use should have higher accuracy or able to have relevant embeddings creation for a particular domain that you are choosing. Once we have these embeddings in space, just let's imagine it is like an organized library with a searchable and smart way to identify information in a short span of time. All this is fine. So where does the business users get benefit out of this? So that's where we want to use the presentation layer, where the user can simply put questions to a semantic search. Semantic search is simple to understand. For example, now the user is asking a question, OK, what is the business trend of a drug XYZ? So the model also tries to understand, OK, now I, all, now I have all the information that I've collected over some time in different formats, and I have stored in a smart library way. Now let us think as an intelligent librarian assistant, so which can help to find the most relevant data points. So once we identify the most relevant data points, let us again take the help of the LLMs, which will help us to generate our augmented answers. It is like you are having an intelligent assistant who helps you through, traverse through a huge volume of data and get you the most detailed answer as well. So this is good for the business users who in usually needs to spend quite amount of time with analytics people and then get information. But how does this is going to solve all the problems at once? Because there are several three problems. There are several problems, of which the three are main. I would say one is like hallucination, and another one could be like data privacy issue, because now I'm asking about putting sensitive information of companies, right? So and especially in pharma, we have quite a lot of sensitive information, which cannot be leaked out to the outside world. But imagine the user who is a business uh, guy who wants to go into some important meeting and also needs to understand such information, what he would does is he simply asks, OK, let me try to know about the brand XYZ again in a particular month, in a particular sales metrics. So he puts the question here. And now we have all the information. The model that we are going to use now should be more specific to build as an open source, but kept inside our premises. So the data privacy issues mainly taken care. And as you might have already suggested, or be expecting this is a RAG kind of architecture, retrieval augmented generation. So the data which is being passed as a context to the model is completely in under our control. So once the data has been in our control, the hallucination is most, more or less taken care because it is not an open LLM kind of application. So now you have the hallucination also taken care. Then comes the important question in every organization. What is the return on investment for this? This is being not a scalable or like a, a one solution which fix everything. It is more of a prototyping where we try to create small applications in quick span of time and put the power into the business user's hand. So they can try it out, and then they can see what value it adds. So that's why I say time is being the most important factor. With this kind of architecture, a quick prototyping, we can get the best returns for the time and the money we are investing in that. This can also be extended to several places, 
but I would suggest maybe top four uh, opportunities that we can slightly modify these components. For example, we can stop at summarization itself, or we can take out the answer generation and look for content generation. Content generation as such may look, for example, like a content creation for particular brands or, or particular uh, markets. But what I would also suggest is, can we fine tune that? Can we make the open source LLM models which are easily available and fine tune to create augmented data? For example, in this world, there is something called as rare diseases, which may not be quite familiar to Indian markets. So these rare diseases are something marked like very few people, but have a specific uh, condition based on due to genetics or several other factors. So the data is also very less to augment it or to do some analysis. So the, that's where these LLM models can be used as a prototype to see whether we can augment the data based on the distribution that we have today. And these rare diseases, for example, we can think like there are 400 million patients are there in the world today, which are several rare diseases under a single umbrella. That is more than number of cancer patients plus Alzheimer's patients. Now you can imagine how many rare disease patients are there. So this is one of the niche area where the LLMs, not just like retrieving some information from PPTs or PDF, can also help you to uh, grow your business and serve patients best. So that is where I would say like these few use cases can be created based on this past prototype. So now you have seen what the past, I would say past perfect, and the present and present continuous goes. Let's see what the future holds. Over to you, Shobana. Am I audible? Yeah? All right. Thank you so much, uh, Gopinath. I'm Shobna. I lead uh, a data science team within AstraZeneca. So we have seen, you know, more about drug discovery, pharma analytics, and you know, like separate solutions as well. I'm here to talk about, you know, the future of work, and I've intentionally chosen to look at the broader perspective, right? So even within a pharmaceutical organization, you have the finance team, you have the HR team, you have the legal team, you have multiple teams that work together. And it's not just the R&D, but every domain within the organization is utilizing AI. Um, so the future of work, the, com the main theme that I'd like to present is how do you enhance, embrace AI you know, as a collaborative partner? I think this is an excellent time to be in AI. There has been curiosity for quite some time around, you know, what AI can do. But now, the, along with curiosity, there is also acceptance. People want to, you know, see what is the solution that you can build. So we've been receiving multiple problem statements from different domains where people are coming to us with questions and they want to see if, you know, we can build an AI solution for them. So this is a time where we have a lot of opportunities. And this, uh, these are the opportunities you know, that we need to utilize to make our transformation ahead. Uh, this is probably an example that multiple of you, you know, have heard of multiple times uh, where you know, we talk about calculator, right? And I think there have been like, a lot of articles as well about it, so I'm probably going to uh, reiterate and talk about it because this is an example that resonated with me the most. So when the calculators were invented, there was a huge uh, you know, discussion around mathematicians and scientists, you know, them being uh, replaced by calculators. But in reality, what happened is that they were able to make, you know, they were able to progress leaps and bounds in their research areas. So right now, we can actually harness the power of AI to you know, move forward and have some transformative advancements in our area as well. Um, there are a couple of points, you know, that I've just put across here. So AI is collaborative role, curiosity is embraced, opportunities unleashed, work transformation, skills reinvented. And to be very honest, I think we've heard multiple perspectives of this, you know, from different people over the last few days and a lot more, you know, between yesterday and today. Just the earlier session that we had was around skills, right? So how do you stay relevant in the job market right now? And yesterday also we saw a session which was around prompt engineering, which is not something that we had you know, even considered, say, even eight to 10 months back. But there are a lot of solutions that we are building now, which basically uses prompt engineering to see you know, how you can actually make that, uh, to make the transformation to build solutions which can be used by everybody. Um, so I just like you know, probably talk about a couple of examples you know, in each of these areas that make sense. For example, if you look at the R&D space, right, we can, there's a vast amount of data that's actually present. So how can you use AI to identify patients, right, that can be used in the clinical trial? So this definitely helps in shortening, you know, your drug life cycle. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, opportunities unleashed 
again, I would say, you know, if I look at the legal department, they have a lot of documents that need to be um, classified. So how do we basically build a tool that helps you classify them as, uh, you know, basically reduce the amount of manual efforts that are required and bring, you know, automated solutions. Now, while these are points that we can use to make our progress, I think what is very important and I, that I saved uh, purposefully is ethical AI stewardship, right? So we need to be very, very careful about how we are leveraging AI. And especially in this space, we need to be very, very careful about the patient data that we use and the drugs that we build are unbiased, right? So there is a lot of, when we talk about bias, there is bias that is present in the model, there is bias that is present in the data. The bias that is present in the data is learned by the model. So this is like one aspect of it. And then there are also other regulatory aspects that we need to generally look at. So ethical AI is something that we need to be very cognizant of, and this is a topic that's very, very close to my um, heart as well. So, you know, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that as we embrace AI as a collaborative partner, we can expect a future where pharmaceutical organizations harness AI's potential that can help us accelerate, you know, drug discovery, enhance quality assurance, improve your manufacturing process, and expedite, you know, regulatory processes. So with the power of curiosity, innovation will flourish, and ethical AI will be the forefront of our progress.